Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by InVision. Find out why so many hot startups are using InVision to prototype, present, and collaborate on design in real time. Sign up for a free 90-day trial today at InVisionApp.com slash twist. And by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Visit Audible.com slash twist for your free audiobook. And by AWS Activate, the Amazon Web Services startup program. It's easy to start and scale your business with AWS. Visit aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey everybody, it's producer Jacob, and this is This Week in Startups. The interview you're about to hear was recorded at Launch Beacon in New York City. Jason sat down with the top folks in retail, e-commerce, beacon technology, and much more. Hope you enjoy these chats with Marco Zappacosta of Thumbtack and Sam Rosen of Makespace. Let us know what you think. Tweet at TWI Startups and at Jason on Twitter. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. How it feeds my people We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money And defeat you Money is the root of all evil Funny how it feeds my people We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money And defeat you Okay, next up is Marco from Thumbtack Hey Marco, how are you? Doing well, how are you? I'm good So, we met a couple of years ago, and um, full disclosure, I'm an investor in your company. I was, I think, I was one of the first. Uh, you were one of the first angel investors. Um, and when was that? In the spring of 2010. It was actually the Open Angel Forum. That oh, really? Kicked off the whole angel. Yeah, run. that's when I started angel inviting angel investors over mm-hmm. to my house or other people's houses to yep. invest in companies. And you were one of the first. Um, and now it's. Um, a couple of years later, and Sequoia's invested in a bunch of other folks. Um, let's take a look at what you're doing specifically. Sure. Oh, you want to plug in your phone here? Yeah, just to give a bit of background. Yeah. You know, Thumbtack helps you accomplish the personal projects that are central in your life, be it repainting your house, getting in shape, helping your kid learn how to play the piano. Um, and these aren't new problems, right? We didn't impose this or create this problem, but we're going about solving it in a very new way. Um, today, you can go online and find names and numbers of professionals in a heartbeat, right? Sure, Yelp, Yelp local, Google, yeah. all this stuff. Um, the challenge, though, is then you as the customer have to do all of the legwork to figure out which of these folks is available, which one's interested in my job, how much are they going to charge me, are they a good fit for me? And quite simply, it's a pain in the ass. It's really hard to get local it's, services. It's very hard. And yeah. so we've basically flipped the model. Okay, let's see. And we can show you what that looks like. And this is not where you started. I remember when you started, it was more like a directory, wasn't it? It was a little bit different. Let's pull um, the iPhone up, if we can. Okay. There we go. Boom. There we go. So this is our new iPhone app. And this is what it looks like when you get started. Um, So imagine if I was looking for catering in my zip code in San Francisco, typically what you would have gotten here on any other site is a list of all the caterers in San Francisco. But actually, that's not very helpful. I want to know which ones are available and interested in my job. So Thumbtack then asks, you know, what type of uh, catering do I need? It's a dinner. I'm looking for a... Now, wait a second. You're glossing over. You pick dinner, and now is asking you the next logical question. Exactly. It might have asked you something different if you picked a different first choice. Exactly. So you're building some sort of threaded we are. map of questions here. And we've done this for almost a thousand different categories. And basically we're creating this skew of every service you can think of. Um, because we end up ax- asking you more questions than you even know. Um, actually, let's go, let's go cocktail party. Um, sure. What type of event is it? Well, this is a cocktail party. Well, it's my birthday next week, so we'll do birthday party. I need setup. I need cleanup. I need a bartender. Um, no servers. What type of food. I want barbecue. Um, it probably asks more question than the customer knows themselves to ask. And this is a big part of what we help with. We're educating on what is possible. And um, I'm willing to spend 40 to 50. And at this point, um, 
Thumbtack knows exactly what I need. And that makes it possible for you, the customer, to get connected with exactly the right professionals. So I won't actually post this, um, but I will show you one I did this morning. So I'm staying with a buddy, and I wanted to um, get him and his wife a uh, massage as a gift. So I put in a request, and I instantly got, well, an hour and a half later, I got these five quotes back. And now what I'm able to do is, first off, compare prices. I can go in and sort of see what they specialize in. If I want to go in and read their profile and learn more about this customer, I can go in and read that. And for the first time, I didn't have to do this legwork. This person came to me. Um, and what we're really helping with is giving customers the confidence to hire um, you know, exactly the right person. In the past, you know, you'd go out and make all those calls, but you'd never be sure, did I find the right person? Did I get a good price? But because we're bringing it to you, we've sort of flipped that and made it much easier. And um, it's going very well. So um, sort of we can flip to the slides at this point, um, unless you're yeah, flip so, over so the slides. I mean, I, I think it's a very elegant and simple app. How do you know when you're asking too many questions, I guess, is one thing. So um, we, we actually can see the slides here, too. It would be good. Yeah. We actually see um, conversion rates go up when we ask the right questions. So typically, ah. you add questions to a form, you see conversion rates go down because customers are annoyed. What we see is it gives them confidence that we know what we're talking about, that we're ah. going to get them connected to the right person. So we use that conversion rate as a way of auditing whether we've put in too many questions or too few. And this is the cumulative? And this is the total business that we've sent to uh, professionals. So last year, we sent um, almost $700 million worth of business to our professionals. Last month, we sent them $200 million. Wow. So we've seen uh, a lot of growth, 4x growth year over year, and there are now 3 million customers coming um, a year, sort of getting their projects accomplished through Thumbtack. And I think what's underappreciated is um, obviously this was a pain for customers in the past to go out and find and hire the right person. It was actually even more of a pain for these service professionals. You know, imagine being a plumber um, and always being on the hunt for a new customer. Um, Traditionally, the only avenues that you had to advertise yourself were, were things like Yelp or um, the Yellow Pages, basically pay, pay for placement. Um, you spent a fixed fee, put your ad up there, and then hope for the best. On Thumbtack, it works very differently. So when you as a customer come in and sort of request a service from us, we send that out to the network of pros that we already have, and then they can choose whether to respond. Um, there's no obligation, they have total discretion, they can read exactly what the customer wants, and that is the best marketing solution that they've ever had. And that's enabled us to scale this uh, very, very quickly. Can we move to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so this is a comparison between us, Angie's List, and Yelp in terms of the number of paying professionals or paying businesses on the platform. We're at 63,000. So we're now bigger than Angie's List in terms of paying professionals. And we're almost going to catch up with Yelp, um, who are just at 72,000, I believe. But you have no Salesforce. But we have no Salesforce. So we've done this in a completely different way. Um, they go out and um, hire a bunch of new grads to dial for, do dial for dollars, right? Call down their list of businesses and, and get them to sign up to, for yearly contracts. Um, we haven't had to do that because the product sells itself. Um, what we do is we'll spend money to buy advertising to build awareness uh, among service professionals of our offering, but then it's self-serve. It's a true self-serve platform where they tell us what they do, where they do it, um, the type of jobs that they like um, to do best, and then we send it to them. Mm. If they're interested, they pay for that introduction, and if they're not, they can pass. So what is the caterer for your 30-person cocktail party for your birthday next week going to pay you? So a percentage of the cost, or you come up with a dollar amount? We come up with a fixed dollar per category that estimates um, a take rate um, on the job value. So catering is actually a pretty big ticket. 
However, a lot of the cost goes to food. So it can't use the same percentage as say something where there is no like, like uh, material cost involved. Um, so I think- Like a massage. Like a massage where it's yeah. pure margin. So catering I believe is like $12 per introduction. Um, and that's per introduction, mm -hmm. whether they get the client or not. Correct. So they have to look at, oh, I'm going to buy 100 of these for $1,200. I need to convert five yeah. or whatever it is to get a $200 per closing of a sale. Yep. And the ROI is ultimately how they judge us, right? If the dollars in aren't more than the dollars out, they're never going to stick around. Um, but our model has given them um, a better ROI than they've seen anywhere else. We hear all the time of people leaving Angie's List, leaving Yelp, leaving Craigslist, because we give them both the control they're after as well as the ROI. So how many service providers, because I used it recently, and, and this wasn't the original business, right? The original business was more directory-like? Yeah, it had more of a directory feel to it. We yeah. were always focused on making the matches. Yeah. Um, we knew that that's how we solved the problem for both sides. Um, but at first, um, we hadn't quite figured out that model. It took us um, a couple years of iteration to, to dial it all in. Um, it certainly was not just a lightning bolt of insight that we had. What, what was the moment that the business started to really grow? Because yeah. it was a little bit of a slog in the beginning, Definitely. I think. And a lot of the early premise, at least that I was really attracted to, was you really were vetting mm -hmm. the providers, like checking their, um, making sure they had a real mailing address, making sure that you had their driver's license on file, their insurance, yep. whatever it is. Did that turn out to be an important thing or maybe less important? It turned out to be important, but reviews were even more important. So um, we've seen customers become more and more comfortable with hiring people on the internet. It's generally a cultural shift that's happening. And so there isn't so much fear around this person being um, uh, a bad person. There's fear around them not having the right fit, not being of the right quality, not charging the right price. That sort of professionalism and experience is what customers are really trying to audit. And the best way to sort of um, present that is through reviews. So I think we have, we move beyond that just vetting to driving a ton of reviews. Um, that's what customers really respond to. That's what they want to see. Ah, uh, yes. About a, two months ago, I said to my people, I need to get the prototypes of Inside.com 2.0 on my phone so I can see what the product looks like on my phone. And so, magically, somebody sends me an Envision link, and I'm clicking on it, and it feels just like the app. And I'm like, wow, this is great. My designer sent me something. And then I said, I need to take notes. I need to put notes in here. I need to share with you my thoughts on that. And then I start using Envision on my desktop. And it is wonderful. I see all the different versions, and then I click and I put a note. And it's not just that I get to put a note. My designer and my CTO put follow-up comments to clarify my note. And then I was like, oh my God, the new Inside 2.0 homepage has too many notes on it. Aren't half of these resolved? And then I see there's a resolve button. And so ding, 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 we start resolving all the issues on the Inside 2.0 homepage, and boom. We're like, got the product done, it's being launched, and everything's perfect. I could not do this without Envision. It is amazing. And people like Adobe, eBay, Zappos, Airbnb, Evernote, Box, and Zendesk agree with me that it's fabulous. The, the plan is, uh, the starter plan is free for 90 days. I mean, that tells you all you need to know. Envision understands, envisionapp.com, by the way, they understand that they're going to win you over. Because it's not super expensive, it's super affordable. And I will never build a startup without this product again. I literally have a, an entire screen on my iPhone, which I'm flipping through right now. And what, what do you see there? Huh? Look, producer Janet, all, how many ins do you see? It's just all ins, it's all ins, it's all in vision. Those are all people sending me different designs and I keep them on my phone because I like seeing the old designs. And then I show them to my board and investors and whatever, or friends of mine, I'm like, hey, David Sachs, look at this design. What do you think of this design? He gives me notes. It's an incredible product, and I'm super enthusiastic about it. And then, of course, like some of the products that I use, I'm enthusiastic about. They come on, and they support my program uh, here at This Week in Startups, which, of course, all of us learn so much with these great startup interviews and VC interviews and all kinds of stuff that we do here. Anyway, envisionapp.com slash twist, envisionapp.com slash twist. Go ahead and sign up. You can have unlimited screens, collaborators, real-time comments, sketch commenting, and more. It works brilliantly. The prototyping is brilliant. And 
it works for your board or investors too. So in vision, I N V I S I O N in vision, I N vision, envisionapp.com slash twist. Thanks again to the team at Envision for making a beautiful product and for supporting this week in startups. Let's get back to this very important episode. Reviews on Yelp, um, which Yelp is a fantastic service. I, I pick a lot of the restaurants I go to, but you have to sort of look at the reviews and, you know, check like, oh, how many reviews has this person written on Yelp? When did they join? Yep. How many friends do they have? I look at all those things in a glance yep. before I decide to take this review seriously or not. Every review in Thumbtack is by somebody who's actually confirmed to have done business? Yeah, so it's who came through us. Got so it. we see what the request was and we see what the review is. So it's tied much more specifically to an actual job. It's not a casual just sort of drive-by review. It's, it's customers w was looking for X and here was how they rated the experience with this professional. Um, and I think Yelp is great at solving the problem of where should I go? If you're trying to figure out a restaurant, a spa, you know, stuff like, something like that, it's really great for that. But it's the wrong solution when you're trying to figure out who can come to me. Mm -hmm. It's a very different problem. Um, and for that, you really need much more of a marketplace experience because you don't have the time or the awareness to ping the whole market of painters or plumbers or tutors to find out who's available, who's interested. Ha we, we actually did this last week because we were painting our house. and. How do you, how many people do you send out, hey, a house in Brentwood is looking to be painted with 10 rooms in it, like, how do you give that lead out? Yeah, so it goes out to, on average, about 20 to 25 professionals, the ones who are in our network, who are qualified, and who serve your area. Um, actually, one But I would think you would have 200 that serve Los Angeles, or 300. It, it so how do you pick? That's an average. Ah. So we'll send it to all of them, because um, what we've found is it's very hard to predict which pros are going to be available and interested. The same reason why you had to call two dozen painters to find the four who are interested in your job, we have to do the same thing. We do it with technology, so it's much faster, but most professionals are busy at the exact moment that you want them, or they're working across town and they can't get there in time, or your job is not quite a fit for what they like to do. Um, so that's why we have to sort of send it out broadly to find the ones who are the perfect match for you. Is this local space becoming um, uh, more so efficient that it's kind of generating new jobs and careers? Because that was one of the things, I don't think anybody who was involved in Uber in the early days certainly I didn't think of, that this was going to be a new category of work. People thought Uber was going to be just a better way to get a Lincoln Town car, but all of a sudden with UberX you saw, oh my goodness, like mm -hmm. somebody who's a photographer is doing this 10 hours a week to subsidize their photography. Literally, that was the person who drove me to the airport yesterday. Yep. Like, are we creating new classes of jobs in the economy by making this so efficient? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think what you're seeing generally is um, like an atomization of the service sector. No longer do you as an independent professional have to work for a bigger brand or agency to get in contact with a customer. We're reducing those transaction costs for the two sides to come together and through that empowering professionals to work the amount that they want to work. So we see this happening a lot in the creative trades. So you were someone who wants to be a DJ um, but you didn't have access to new clients. Through Thumbtack, you can finally build your book of business and become a full-time DJ. Same with photographers. Um, you know, if you're a plumber or a tradesman, that's something that you've committed to and you've probably made a lifestyle out of it already. Um, but for these creative um, jobs that people didn't know they could do full-time, we're definitely bringing that to them. And let me just plug in one last time. I think something that would be interesting for you guys to see is the jobs um, that have come in in just the last minute. Great, so let's pull up the uh, iPhone one more time. And you're and about we'll take a question from the audience or two. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, Brandon's here, he'll run over. You're about to see our admin section. So it is a... Uh, oh, so this is admin for this, you. This is internal. And yeah. what I want to show you are the requests that have come in in just the last minute. So wedding band, house cleaning, software development. First aid training. First aid training, landscape design, CPR training, above ground swimming pool installation, horseback riding lessons. You know, this is really the dream. We are replacing the yellow pages. And this is all coming in in just the last minute. 
all across the country. Life coaching, interior design, limo driving, local moving, TV mounting. I mean, in a way, you know, I always felt like what you were doing was cleaning up and structuring Craigslist. It was mm -hmm. so appealing to me when you first shared the visit, vision because we all felt so nervous about using Craigslist. I mean, it was an incredible you know, innovation and it certainly changed the classified ads, but oh boy, was it like, you felt like it was Russian roulette, like, oh my God, who's gonna show up at my house? Absolutely. Um, and the, the crazy thing is despite customers spending $800 billion a year on these categories of services, um, there's really been no innovation from really the dawn of newspaper classifieds or dawn of the yellow pages because the, the big online players today, Craigslist, Yelp, Angesus, are really online versions of these old offline products. They haven't fundamentally reorganized how this interaction happens and that's sort of what we've been chasing and doing for these last four years. Hey, uh, when you operate in the real world, bad things happen. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? I mean, it, what's the worst thing that's happened and how do you so deal with it? It was a big fear starting, right? You hear the yeah. stories on Craigslist or things like that. Um, the worst thing that has happened is a pro getting prepaid for a job and then walking away. Ooh. So pocket a couple thousand dollars. And we help the customer file a police report and collect that money back. Um, but we've been shocked at how little has happened. Um, and the, the reason is we are giving the customer choice and we're giving them all the data that they need to make up confident hiring decision. So there's no, um, we're not forcing anybody upon them. They can do the homework, they can see the reviews, and because of that, not I much I bet you happened. also, if you're paying $12 for a lead or $5 or $20, like if you were a grifter or criminal, you probably wouldn't want to use your real name to go buy a lead for 10 bucks. Exactly. It's kind of a little bit of a paper trail. Exactly. I mean, the whole incentive structure of this industry is changing. You know, in the past, a locksmith had a lot of power over you. You were never going to see him again. You were trying to get back into your house, and he'd show up and double the charge on you, right? And you couldn't do anything about it. At this point, the locksmith on Thumbtack have a reputation. They have a permanent profile. They have a place where that reputation is going to stick with them, so they can't be a jerk to you. They can't double the price because then they'd stop earning business. The same reason why you know, Uber drivers are nicer than cab drivers. They've got a permanent reputation that's sort of attached to them, and so they act the part. Let's take a question from the audience. Yeah, so my question was, uh, how, how many uh, new services are you adding um, like every quarter? Like what new services are you seeing that people want that you didn't have in your initial um, uh, Cash, cachet of, of uh, business. Because I, I, when you started talking, I went and I just started looking at some and see what you had and what you didn't have. So how often are you adding new things? Yeah, We have a team of three people full time who are working on our sort of category tree and questions. Um, so things happen all the time that we haven't seen before and we have to make the call, is it worth investing in that? So we got a recent one, it was cat running. Someone looking for someone to run their cats. Not cat walking. Running, cat running. It's a subsection of cat walking. Um, and you know what, that's probably not a big market. I'm not gonna ask the team to devote too much time to that. I'd rather them sort of work on home improvement things. So we have to balance being everything to everybody versus being great at the categories we I have I think you today. should go ahead and do that just for the fun of it. Like, how big is your cat? 10 yeah. to 20 pounds, yeah, exactly. 20 pounds. How far does your cat like to run? Exactly. What pace does your cat run? My, my cat does a five minute mile. Um, so uh, you'll see us for the time being not add too many um, as we just flesh out the ones we have to be awesome at those. But at the end of the day, we want to be the Amazon for services. We want to be the one stop shop anytime you need a local professional of any stripe. And so that includes cat runners on those rare occasions. Um, what about um, the sort of um, execs of the world or other people who are trying to uberfy different categories like we're only going to clean houses but we're going to do it for the specific price for a specific time you're going to press you know one button and get that like sort of compressing you know the yeah. most common thread there have you thought about doing an on-demand massage or an on-demand yeah it's, it's house cleaning kind of thing and it's tricky I think um, I think companies in our space have over indexed on the uber model so uber if you think about it 
you're renting a commodity. It's the back seat of a car. You're not hiring a person. It just happens to take a person to operate that back seat. Um, that's very different than hiring a person who's going to come into your home and maybe be with your child. That is not a commodity purchase. So it's hard to build sort of a commodity UX around it. Um, I look at these cleaning companies, and they're actually all on Thumbtack. Hmm. Handybook, Exec. Homejoy, they get clients on Thumbtack. They're like power sellers on eBay. And we think there is room for technology-powered agencies to sort of deliver services, but I do not believe that there is one sort of house cleaner company to rule them all. If that were the case, we would have already seen more of that. Um, technology wasn't keeping that from happening. Another question, you had one? Uh, what's the most sophisticated project that's been accomplished? Oh, we've seen like million dollar home uh, remodels and build-ups. Uh, there was actually like a six-story building in Brooklyn uh, where somebody found the general contractor and the architect through us. Um, that's certainly exceptional. Um, we see home improvement projects typically happening in the $10,000 range. So you're adding a deck, you're remodeling a bathroom, things what like that. What does that cost to remodel a bathroom? What, do you, what does that lead cost? So gen yeah, general contracting leads are the most expensive ones. I think they're $35. Do you set that price or does the market set the price? We do, but in... Uh, looking at how the market reacts to it, you know, oh. and we get a lot of feedback. We have, you know, these 60,000 plus pros who we can email and survey and say, hey, what's the typical job cost? How often are you winning? So we want to set the, the, the fee appropriately. You know, we're trying at the end of the day to help them make money. That's isn't, how we're Isn't successful. part of the magic of Google's ad network that mm -hmm. certain people will overpay and just because they want the client so bad? I think the magic is that the price gets set at the margin by the market, right? That they bid it up to the point where the person with the best business model is giving Google the most margin. That's the magic. Yeah. Um, and we don't have that sort of mechanism it's in place It's kind of sinister in a way because there are people <laughs> who will be like, oh, I'll lose money on my catering business I get through Google yeah. to build my brand or something and I'll make it back somehow. Exactly. So we've decided not to introduce that. There's no auction component. We set the price um, and I think that'll stay the case for a long time. Uh, all right, listen. One oh, one more? Okay. Hi. Oh, hey, David. Uh, hi, Jason. Nice I guess I have a few questions about this. One is um, sort of the model of the yellow pages is not really very efficient in terms of how people tend to find what they need. Uh, word of mouth, for example, with regard to a lot of these uh, help services, people, you know, believe in that. Uh, social media, you know, people constantly asking on Facebook, do you know some, somebody who can paint my house or who can do things like that? And then there's also um, <clears throat> the matter of, you know, the people who are really busy you know, tend to be the best, so they're going to be least likely to be in your pool. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? So, in terms of people going to their social networks, I think that's a reflection of the fact that there is no, until Thumbtack, no good place to go that has the insight into the market to give you a reliable introduction. If you think about 10 years ago, what would you, what would you do when you wanted to buy a camera? You'd probably ask your friends. Today, that's inconceivable. Right. You ask Amazon because your, the reviews on Amazon and the knowledge on Amazon is way richer than what your friends know. Um, and I think the same is going to happen in services where people are looking for a great deal from the right pro, and we are much more likely to give it to them than a random friend on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> with regard to your second question, that the best people are the busiest, um, I think that is true to some degree, but uh, we've talked to a lot of professionals, and very, very, very few of them are full, are not interested in taking new business. Uh, you talk to any of these local small businesses, and they're all sort of struggling and hustling to get more clients. And that's why we've been able to attract so many of them. Uh, it's exceptional when a small business is sort of booked up. Awesome. Let's hear from Marco from Thumbtack. Well done. Thanks, awesome. Sir. Congratulations on the business. Uh, and last but not least, Sam from MakeSpace. Wow, you guys made it all the way to the end, and a bunch of people back there. Um, hey, if you have feedback on how this went, team at launch.co, team at launch.co. Hey, Sam. Here's another Brooklyn boy. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. From Bay Ridge. Mike's from Bay Ridge. He's over there. 
My two brothers are here. We got a lot of Bay Ridge. I saw Josh guys. earlier. You saw Josh earlier? You know, I haven't seen him since 2011, uh -huh. Launch Conference. And we never discussed this. My, uh, my very first institutional investor I met at Launch Conference. You did? Yes. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Venture 51, Brandon Oh, Ryan. Venture 51. Yes. Yeah, those guys are awesome. Yeah, I so I met them at your conference uh, awesome. three years ago. Well, that's why we do it. Inspire, <laughs> uh, su to support founders and inspire innovation is what we do. Now, you've been on a tear with uh, MakeSpace. So tell us, what's going on in the business? How does it work? Has anybody heard of MakeSpace, by the way, in the audience? Oh, wow. So some people have. Is anyone Has anybody using used it? it? Yeah. <laughs> that's a bit oh, you really? have? Really? Awesome. What did you think? It was super easy experience. My children are also using it right now. Ah, so it was Amazing. super easy experience. So explain to people what you're doing. Yeah, so we're creating at MakeSpace cloud storage for physical things. And the, the easy way to think about it is we are like Fresh Direct for storage. We drop off these plastic bins at customers' homes. Yep. They schedule a re reservation online. We show up. Uh, they fill up the belongings that they want to store with us, things that fit into this bin, as well as certain oversized items like golf clubs, skis, et cetera. And then we take them back away to a big warehouse. And what we actually do is we create a digital catalog for them online so that whenever they want something, instead of visiting that dinky storage unit on the West Side Highway like here in New York, uh, they simply log into their account, push a button, and they can get any of their stuff back. Uh, so pretty simple. How, when did you launch it? So uh, I actually incubated this as the first entrepreneur in residence at Upfront Ventures out in Los Angeles. Mark Suster's year. company. Or, right. I'm sorry, Mark Suster's venture firm. That's right. So you incubated. That's right. So I was working on it from January 1st through June 1st of last year. And we actually became operational in September. Um, so it's really less than you know eight, nine months and how has the reception been? What cities are you operating in? So we're currently available here in New York City, and we're actually the highest rated consumer storage company in New York already. It's uh, kind of a low benchmark, though. I mean, <laughs> most people hate these storage companies. Yeah, I mean, I mean let's a, be honest. It's a, I mean, to have an 80 plus, we have an 82 NPS as of today. So to that have that promoter you, score yeah, coming up again, so, great. So, you know, to even have something as high as that is great. But uh, you're right. Well, the competition is actually pretty low in terms of customer satisfaction. People hate them. Yeah, I mean, think about it. It's, it's actually, the problem with self-storage is that it's a real estate business. And what I mean by that is the following. You know, these b buildings were bought 70 years ago by someone who literally bought parking lots and then turned them into uh, a self-storage facility because there's very little overhead. And what they ultimately do is they flip it into luxury condos or hotels or even parking lots, which if you're looking at uh, the diversification of a real estate portfolio, self-storage is great. They only have to hire or one person that works there, and the tenants just keep paying because they store away their stuff. My problem was I wanted to change the business completely because after Hurricane Sandy, uh, my ex-girlfriend and I had, we had to rent her a storage unit because she lost her entire apartment in the flood. And when we put that stuff in that night, I literally could not find her snow boots that we had just stored away. And I said to myself, why isn't there Dropbox meets a self-storage unit? Yeah. And what I realized is there are all those reasons why consumers hate self-storage, for example, it's, it's dingy and they don't put a lot of money into it, is because that affects essentially their, the money that they can make. Um, why there aren't trash cans on the floor at self-storage. Well, they actually don't want you to throw stuff away. The problem is um, the business model fundamentally is broken for consumers. And when you start to flip it like a reverse Amazon where you take that big, you know, everyone's seen Manhattan mini storage, I'm sure, or something like this on the West Side Highway. If you take that facility and you move it outside of the city center, just like Amazon did, you can start to do three things. You can start to attract customers that maybe don't live within a certain distance of the facility. You can actually start to pass along a cost savings because just like the bookstore had to raise the price of their uh, books every year to go coincide with the, the rental price, um, self-storage is no different. We can actually pass along that cost savings. And the third is we never run out of space. So Manhattan Mini Storage or any other uh, storage facility, they fill up and that's it. The only way to get in is to pay a higher price and that's why you see the rent going up every nine months. With MakeSpace, we can fill up a warehouse unlimited and just- And how far away out. from- you know, where we are right now, do you store currently? Yeah. And eventually, where do you see it being stored? Yeah. Absolutely. So if you think about like a physical data center, right? Yeah. Almost like uh, Amazon Web Services, thinking of it that way. Um, our big warehouse is in Jersey City, New Jersey. And we have a distribution center here in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which is where our vans meet in the morning because we, we run a vertically integrated uh, transportation service that the people coming to your home are actually make space employees. They're insured by us. We have a $2 million insurance policy. We actually will move that. So you didn't outsource it? No, everything's vertically integrated. In fact, I'll show you some of the driver applications yeah. that we've built um, in order to you know, really power that vertically integrated. Yeah, let's pull that up here. Let's show it. So actually, what I'll do is I'll do a little quick demo. Yeah. And we're launching something on stage for the first time oh, here. Cool. 
which is our consumer-facing application. So let me see. Let's pull up the uh, iPhone, yeah. So I'll see. actually, I'll pull up the iPhone. Um, Oop, here, we here we go, pardon me. No worries. So what we have here is a, a box of uh, winter gear, as you can all see. This was my, my ski and uh, some goggles and stuff like that. So are we up? Perfect. Yep. So what we're actually going to do is, let's say we've already dropped this bin off at the customer's home. And this is something that we're showing for the very first time. And I'll go kind of slowly through this. We want people to never forget what they have in storage. So what we're actually doing is launching in about four to six weeks an iPhone application to let people individually itemize all of the stuff that they have in MakeSpace. So we would select the bin here. I'm going to type in the description. And we see people do things like kids' clothing to sure. you know, all kinds Books, of Books, whatever. Books, exactly. So winter clothing. So boom. winter clothes. We're going to take a picture of the, of the bin. So we got a general idea of what's at least on the top layer. Yeah, or I could take a thousand photos of every single thing if I want, but that's just one here. And then we'll add the tag winter. Ah, but you could put gloves, you could put goggles, you could put, you could put all that stuff so you actually have a more refined absolutely. idea of what's So I'm going to hit save. Yeah. And this is actually something cool. So it says, hey there, we noticed that you're using the following tag, hashtag winter. We'll use that information to remind you to reorder your stuff before the season starts. Ah, so very cool. So the interesting thing is, you know, the Internet of Things, essentially, and I know the IFTT people, IFTTT, IFT. IFT, it, yeah. They're building the plumbing, right? right? But who's actually building the stuff, the things? Right. Like, who's actually building the house that we live in in the Internet of Things? And this is something that's totally different from traditional self-storage, which they want to leave you in there, and they don't remind you with an email about where's your stuff. Um, they don't say, hey, you might want to come get it. So now what we're actually doing is having the opportunity to let our stuff talk back to us. Like, maybe I want to get my winter stuff out yeah. in winter. Or maybe they see that I am all of a sudden with a phone. I'm in San Francisco for the weekend, and I need something else. Right? Mm -hmm. So we actually want to start adding the power of the mobile phone to something so simple as, as physical storage. Got it. So that's, that's an example of the, the iPhone app that we have here. But what's really cool, talk about our driver application. So I already made a reservation here at the launch conference. Uh, so based on, this is my phone number, <laughs> if you want to call me. Yeah. Uh, this is the address, 125 West 18th Street. And essentially, this is the first time I'm ever showing um, a browser-based application that our drivers use that will help us roll out to other cities. Um, and the reason for that is if you have this vertically integrated transportation team, we want to make sure it's as lean as possible. So we've got deep linking into maps. Uh, you can text or call the customer. Soon we'll actually, um, for privacy reasons, we want to make sure that we can hide the phone just like Yeah, you can go Uber. through Trillia. Yeah, it, Uber did that pretty yeah. soon after. It's not that hard, but yeah. uh, we're only launching, uh, we're only ramping up three more engineers actually. They're full-time employees. It's They're full -time. for them to call the customer. So, <laughs> so just to show you, um, Normally, this is a barcode scanner on Android because mm -hmm. you can implement a barcode scanner. I'm just going to type in B1066, add the new bin. I can have notes, right? So it's like Sam was on stage with Jason. I can sign off when we create a paper trail. And ah, so they would hand that to you to sign off. Exactly right. And then I can complete the pickup. I'm returning zero empty bins. And that's it. Ah, yes, Audible. I am so glad to read an Audible ad. I am an Audible junkie. I am, I'm, I'm on the Platinum program. Let me just tell you what the Platinum program is. And it's not even in the ad copy that I'm supposed to talk about the Platinum program. This is where you get like dozens of titles a year. You pay like 200 bucks. And I, every year, for the last six or seven years, have been buying a dozen or two audiobooks. That's how addicted I am to Audible. I've always been addicted to Audible because I want to get smarter. And so I listen to everything. I mean, I've listened to Fifty Shades of Grey. I, I didn't enjoy it. I got like a third of the way in. I stopped listening. But at least I knew on a pop culture level what's going on with Fifty Shades of Grey. But I see, I find titles in there that I really need. Um, the one I'm listening to right now is absolutely awesome. It's called Bird by Bird. I did a search for like writing. And then I did a search, uh, you know, on Google for like the best writing books. Because, I, you know, I, I write a lot. I try to be a better writer. I try to be a better performer for you guys. And uh, I found this book, Bird by Bird. I've never heard of it. It was like, had incredible reviews on Audible. I listened to it. My God, it blew my mind. And I listen to it in my spare time. I'm on a plane. I'm tired. I pop in the headphones. I zone out. I listen to two hours of a book. I don't have to hurt my eyes reading because I'm tired after a long day. I'm in an Uber, boom, I pop it in, I get another quick half hour in. I'm on the subway, wherever I am, boom, another half hour of knowledge, another hour of knowledge, 150,000 titles of every genre. And it's got this crazy syncing between audiobooks and Kindle. So if you're a Kindle freak, I am not, but if you are, that's fine. 
you can start syncing all this stuff up. Um, and it's great for the car, obviously. Um, if you don't like the book, they'll actually exchange it for another one, no questions asked. That's incredible. I, you know, I haven't actually ever used that, but I'm going to think about that because there's one or two books like Fifty Shades of Grey that maybe I didn't care for, and I could get another book for that. That's great. So you can buy up, you can buy individual books, or you can be an Audible listener program and you get like books every month. There's tons of different offers, but this is the one I want you to do. Go to audible.com/twist. Go to audible.com/twist, and you will get a 30-day free trial. Download the book of the week for free. I'm going to say bird by bird if you're into. Um, writing. If not, there's an incredible fiction book called uh, The Martian, and it is amazing. It's about this guy who crash lands on Mars in the first... Um, uh, it's by a guy named Andy Weir, by the way. And it basically details how he crash lands on Mars as part of a Mars mission, a routine Mars mission, and gets left behind, and how he scientifically, and it's supposed to be pretty accurate, um, is able to save himself on Mars until the next mission comes in a couple of years because we're doing like mission, Mars missions every couple of years. This book is phenomenal. It's incredible to listen to and it levels you up and gets you smart for when Elon Musk takes us to Mars. You're going to know what's going on. Go listen to The Martian. The Martian by Andy Weir is my pick of the week and you are going to love it. And we're doing a contest. So if you do get Audible, and I suggest you do, just email us, hit forward when you get your confirmation, and forward that over to audible at launch.co. That's our email address, audible at launch.co. And you will be entered into a contest to win an iPad mini signed by me. That contest is ending at the end of September. Go ahead and thank Audible, audible underscore com on the Twitter. I love, you. I love the team at Audible. I love the product. I've loved it forever, and I will love it forever. I cherish. And you know what's happening to me more and more? I take out my Audible and I show my books to my friends. My friends take out their Audible. They show their books to me. And then we start trading recommendations and ordering more books. It is amazing. You will get so smart. I love this product. I'm so happy that they sponsor the program because to me, this would be like, you know, Coke Zero sponsoring the program because I love drinking Coke Zero or like, you know, it would be like New York Strip Steak with Bernays Sauce sponsors the program. And I sit here and eat a New York Strip Steak with Bernays Sauce. That's how much I love Audible. Uh, okay, let's get back to the program. I could go on for hours about Audible. Enough. This essentially is now powering our entire backend. So I, I only dropped off one bin, but if I had dropped off five bins, that's why it prompted that question, how many empty bins are you picking up? If for some reason there was a discrepancy, essentially we're now outsourcing that pen and paper to a web-based technology. It's great. Um, and so... When do the do you store all the uh, boxes in Greenpoint and then take one truck every week out to your Jersey City to save yeah. time and tolls, or what do you do? And then if I want something <laughs> when, back, it, when the company started, we, we probably didn't have to go off to, out that much. But what's right. actually happened is we're getting you know hundreds to, literally sometimes thousands, of, especially around the college kids' time, hundreds of thousands of items. And what we started to do is batch upload those items from a small staging facility to a big warehouse that you might see uh, in Jersey City. And the way that we think about scaling the business is actually in two ways. One, you can run this distribution center in Boston, Philadelphia, DC, and it doesn't actually have to hold the inventory. It doesn't have to hold the customer's belongings for more than a few days that we put on a, on a on a tractor trailer overnight and send it to our big warehouse facility. The second thing that's actually working really well for us, pardon me, is, a, is what we call Make Space Air. So Make Space Air is actually something that allows customers of Make Space to send stuff from anywhere or to anywhere. So we've had customers who are in Tokyo moving to New York saying, hey, where can I send my stuff to? We let them send to Make Space, Air, to Make Space via the mail. Um, ah, so I don't have to have you pick it up. I could UPS you stuff. That's right. So I could get these boxes from you, or can I send you a UPS box and tell you to dump you it in one? You can send us a UPS box, and we'll you know, measure out the cubic footage. We actually have something launching not too far off where you'll be able to find make space bo boxes, air boxes at retail stores that you can actually ah. batch upload to, you know, to make space by buying a kit, and we'll reimburse you the cost for the cardboard. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things that we can do, but the biggest is you know, we had a customer last week who is in Tennessee moving to China, and where were they supposed to put their things, right? And they used MakeSpace to mail right. it to us, and it's almost like that physical goods what's escrow. The biggest, and that's yeah, what's the biggest order you've stored? Like, has somebody put 20 <laughs> boxes in? Store? Yeah, the biggest one, I, and I felt so bad for this guy, personally did it. So we, we the founders did like... What do you mean first, you personally did it? I personally did the first several hundred MakeSpace pickups myself. Really? Me and my, my business partners, yeah. The worst one that I uh, emotionally was, these are people's things, right? This is my stuff. Yeah. And it's not like Amazon where if you lose one, we replace it. I actually did uh, a man who was being evicted. And oh. it was terrible because not only was he getting evicted, but he was a hoarder. 
and imagine the emotional anxiety of being separated from all of your things. He had like over 35 of bins or more, 40. And we, we actually thought he was going to churn out of the system because he was getting evicted. Right. He's been our best customer since, but it was so emotional to be there. Yeah, yeah. And what do you guys charge? 10 bucks a month per so box or something? So each one of these bins is $6.25. It starts at, at we, uh, for a minimum of four bins, which is 25 bucks a month. And then each additional bin is just... So five. what would that be in terms of Manhattan real estate? Have you ever sort of backed into... Kind of the cubic footage? Yeah, like if it was $6... Because this looks like you could put 10 of these in a closet. Right. So for 10, it would be like 60 bucks a month. Yeah, so I mean, if you think about it... I think it, your closet's much this bigger. This is three cubic feet, so it's yeah. $2 and something. But the big thing is we play Tetris a lot better than even someone at Manhattan Mini Storage ever could. Yeah. Right? And if you get a space for, you know... 64 cubic feet for 125 bucks a month. The reality is you're only using about half of it. Right. And that's actually the benefit, again, back to the Amazon-like model, is we can play Tetris better than someone can at their local Manhattan mini store. And you are subletting storage or you're finding your own buildings? How are you doing that? I mean, we started very lean. Uh, the companies raised, thankfully, $10.1 million. But when we started, we were wondering, how can we get this business off the ground? And we uh, subcontracted space through, um, you know, someone who would rent us space in a big warehouse. And we would pay by the unit that we put inside. But as you can see, as we had this path to being, you know, building our own infrastructure, one day we would absolutely, you know, leverage the space ourselves. And is this price going to come dramatically down or is it the car? Because it does seem like as you have, you know, the drivers fixed, people don't, Yeah. do people order their stuff back that often and do they pay for that? So we do see people that, you know, use this almost like I said, a, a second closet and that's a great uh. use case. But, you know, you hinted at something very interesting, which is why am I paying for long-term parking uh, when I park in short-term parking here on the West Side Highway. Right. How can you uh, differentiate your service by maybe arbitraging real estate lo location prices? And you would never want to drive to Jersey City or no. Scranton, Pennsylvania or the middle of you know, Ohio, but we can. And we, as long as we can get your stuff back to you within 24 or 48 hours or an amount of time that we guarantee for you, um, we really could put it anywhere. What is that? Would, would that be tiered pricing then? Like two days is this price and one day turnaround is this price? I mean, imagine a world where we say to you, hey, it's X dollars per month and your stuff is stored here and it's Y dollars per month and it's stored there. Or we say, hey, it costs you $79 to get it in one day turnaround or $29 to get it within three to five days. Got it. But what right it, now the guarantee is 24 to 48 hours. What does it cost to get my boxes back? So it's $29 flat, which is any New Yorker knows less than the price of a round trip taxi here. And you can get one or all of your bins back. Even if it was the guy with 35? Yeah, so it's He would pay a dollar per <laughs> bin to get his it's bins back. We, we chose a pretty flat pricing model. And, you know, so far, I, I think just like any service, whether it's Zappos, where you see power customers taking advantage yep. of the service, there's almost a law of averages here. Are people using this for things other than storing, well, I wasn't thinking dead bodies or anything. No, memory. Like, oh. <laughs> no, like, you know, like, the street finds its own use for technology. Heels I mean, of cocaine. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, are people storing things that you'd anticipate, like some restaurant is storing stuff? or like we, the, the one surprise we had was we had retail customers, and there's a lot of retail people in here today, who said, look, uh, we don't actually want to have inventory in our store because it costs us money to store it there. Uh, right? And it's very similar to the argument that Iron Mountain presents, which is a, an archiving company, um, document archiving. They present to law firms that says, why ha you have to keep these records anyway. Why keep them in your you know, Madison Ave or Fifth Ave uh, law office X dollars per square foot, yeah. why not store them off-site with us? And it's a very similar you know, argument. So we've seen business uh, use cases where literally people want to store away inventory, retail inventory, and we've done a lot of trips back to them. Really? That's yeah. fascinating. It would have to be pretty expensive inventory. Uh, I, I think that the, it's probably even more expensive real estate. <laughs> ah, I get it. And what about that sort of business with documents? Do you think you're going to have a time? No, we, I, I, we want to leave that to the people like an Iron Mountain. And that's, there's a clear delineation between like a business and a consumer brand. Do, are people looking to you as a moving service? Because I'm in the middle of moving. Yeah. And I was talking to you about this. <laughs> and I was actually talking to my wife. I was like, I wish there was yeah. a way to just have you guys pick up 30 boxes, right. store them, and then do the whole thing where I ship them. 
it would probably be less than using one of these untrustworthy moving companies. Absolutely. I, I mean, there are ancillary revenue streams like this one. We were actually, we call it hacked because we didn't have a three month minimum. And I was like, I was seeing requests for more than 20 bins, less than a month that they wanted to store. And they were changing the, ad, the address of where they picked up and dropped off. They, so they wanted you to so, pick oh, up absolutely. on the 25th and <laughs> deliver on the second. Right. And you'd see them come in right at the end of the month. So they'd be like, I really need to pick it up on the 30th. Uh, we decided that for right now to focus that we put in a three month minimum so that we weren't getting hacked with moves, but people were very clever. Well, if they're hacking it. you with moves, what about just giving them a price? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, but you know, the, right now we want to ensure that we focus on our market, continue to grow, but it's absolutely something we could address because we know that at the time people are moving, they're trying to make space. What do the moving company, what do the storage companies think of you? I mean, I don't are know, they anyone, <laughs> trying to compete now? Did anyone read Business Insider about an hour and a half ago? Um, there's no. just an article up on Business Insider. Uh, one of our biggest competitors here uh, rebranded themselves. It used to be blue and white, and now all of a sudden it's green. It says, don't trust the cloud. And whether that's our local competitor here uh, at Manhattan Mini or uh, public storage taking pot shots at don't us. Don't trust the cloud. Don't trust. I, I think they literally, you know, it's the blockbuster Netflix thing, right? Or like, I want to offer everyone in this room, like, f I'll, I'll print out your Gmail and store it in a Manhattan Mini storage for a, a year if that's yeah. what they think is the way we're going. You didn't print out these uh, <laughs> flyers to like create a virus and say, that's bizarre. Why would they come after you? I mean, it's like a typewriter saying, you know, don't trust a computer in a floppy disk. They're going to lose your information. I think this is a, a toad sitting in, in the water that it's boiling in. Yeah, it's fascinating. Questions from the audience? We must have some questions. There's someone right there. Okay, there we go. Boom. Um, two feature requests. Um, <laughs> Are you a current customer or um, considering? Considering. Ah. Okay, so use launch uh, as a code and you'll get 50 bucks. That <laughs> to everyone in the room. So okay, launch gets you 50 that. bucks. That's pretty good. <laughs> right, okay. so I want one of these in London <laughs> yeah. okay, and Sydney. And like when I move between cities, I'd yep. like the stuff to be moved directly to that data center or whatever set center you want to call it. Yep. So it can be kind of an off-site extension. Um, when can you do that? <laughs> yeah. It's a great, so it's actually really interesting. You know, people talk about the network effect of a, of a business. In particular, you saw this with Facebook, yep. having network users not leaving the system. But I really admire Uber because what they've done is when you came here to New York, you pushed a button and you got a car. Yeah. When you go back to LA, you push a button, you got a car. When you right. go to San Francisco, you push a button, you got a car. When you go to Vegas, I don't know what you do. You're fucked. <laughs> it's terrible. It's okay. a disaster. You wait online is what you do. Got it. Or you pay somebody $50 and you complain about Uber, to go maybe. for three minutes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So what I was going to say is, you know, we see people like this gentleman just asked where we had someone m pick up and move to London and wouldn't they just like to get to London, push a button, have their stuff. Yeah. And I actually think there's a network effect of people who bounce around. We've actually got a customer. Uh, his name's Colin Hughes. He's a very well-known photographer and he is a tech nomad. And he was actually one of the inspirations for this Make Space Air product that he's you know, post-geographic nomad in the sense that he travels with a laptop, his, you know, Dropbox is his photo album, and he literally is in New York for maybe one week. He'll have MakeSpace meet at his hotel room or his Airbnb where he's staying. He'll change out the stuff that he needs for Mexico because he's coming from Tokyo, and off he goes. Wow. So we have people that are literally using MakeSpace like their closet in the cloud. And just like you mentioned, you know, when you're in Sydney or you're in, in um, London, you know, we, what it should look like one day is that closet in the cloud. It doesn't matter where you are. You should push a button and be able to get your stuff. Imagine the make space pop up in Vail when we say, hey, don't travel home with your skis that you're going to sit in your garage. Oh, wow. Upload your skis to make space and they'll meet you at whatever slope or whatever resort you want to go to next year. Yeah, you just store all that stuff sure. and never have to go. And you can make the decision to store it there in, outside of Vail or you can make a decision to store it somewhere in Colorado, or you can send it back to the big distribution facility, and that's where we get smart with technology. Was there another question? Yeah, let's take a last question. Well, I was thinking about using one of your uh, competitors last year, and it really helped crystallize my thinking about pricing. Um, you know, I've learned that stuff tends to stay in storage longer than I think it will. And uh, your, your pricing seems high compared to conventional storage. Uh, do you plan to address this, uh, or do you just have more business than you can handle with current pricing? I, I think what we really 
we've really hit a, a nail on the head with the current pricing, and, and customers value the convenience and accessibility for MakeSpace. That said, you raise a really interesting point, is why shouldn't physical storage follow the same price economics of virtual cloud storage? Yeah, it should but go down every X number of years. Absolutely right. So I'm not going to foreshadow anything, but right now our prices will stay the same, and that's something that no competitor of mine will do in New York, right. and I can guarantee that you'll see us shake up the industry in a few years as well. Ah, and it'll be different pricing probably per city. Sure. I mean, it's different cities have different cost structures and movement patterns and whatever. That's right. So, uh, and second city, third city, I mean, have you perfected it here in New York enough to go to another city? Yeah, the focus is to continue to perfect here in New York City. But we've already got customers, like I said, from Tennessee to Tokyo to London. So with MakeSpace Air, we've already uh, expanded our horizon. Is it profitable? Like, have you figured out that part of the model? Like at six bucks a box yeah. and 29 bucks, like, is it sustainable? Like, you're not gonna go out of Abs business no. and have a problem? <laughs> Absolutely sustainable on a unit economic basis, but what you see, just like any, we look like a SaaS business, where there's a huge investment in capital expenditure to create, essentially, the product, and then you have lock-in for a long time, because once people are in the system, they continue to use MakeSpace, they love the experience, and if I gave you a second closet or a third closet in your New York City shoebox, for lack of a better term, um, you're probably gonna stick around for a long time. The second thing is it expands beyond just cities because uh, I think it's about 30% of um, uh, two-car garages can only fit one car. Yep, but that's true. It doesn't matter if you're in a man, you know, mansion on Central Park West or low-income housing in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, where I've done pickups in both. Everyone could use a little bit more space. Go ahead. Question? I think it's a fabulous business, and uh, if you were in Boston, I would start using you tomorrow. But looking at the economics, um, you're sort of a smaller version of pods, PODS, portable on-demand storage. Yeah. So if you had more than three or four of these bins, wouldn't it make sense for the consumer to use a pod instead? Yeah, how do the pods compare? I see so those on the street sometimes. What are those You've cost? seen them in LA. I haven't ever seen one in New York because they're, they're huge. And what, really, what we're really riding, by the way, they're very expensive because you have to actually get permits to get a pod into a city. Ah. Um, the biggest thing is, um, you know, you mentioned the, the pod. It's so big, you forget what's inside. What's nice about this is you've got an experience where you can log in lo online to an account, see exactly what you want, and get just one bin back or get all of them. Right. Um, and really, it's, it's more of a, of a user experience problem with the traditional pod. Um, we're betting on, on urbanization and kind of micro-living in that more and more people are moving to cities and they're living in smaller and smaller places. And people who use pods mostly, actually they're, one of the big parts of the business is to rent out the pod as a structure, you know, <coughs> as an office on a job site, yep. things like that. Um, less so um, actually for people who need storage like they need a second closet. Yeah. And with less than 50% of the actual storage business being for moves, we think there's a huge opportunity in, in a company like MakeSpace that's providing storage for people who aren't moving. You have also these micro apartments, right? Bloomberg was able to push through like uh, yeah. 150, 200 square, square foot feet. apartments. That's right, and we think this has great implications for cities like Singapore and you know where there's or Tokyo where there's a very small amount of space, uh, and that's why we really continue to bet on on urban. Okay, final final question. <laughs> oh, congratulations, Sam! I think it's an awesome business model. Thank you very much. Um, when you were talking about skis, what made me think of it? I'm looking at the box and I'm going. I've I've seen some self storage units. There's some pretty big, weird things in these self storage units. How do you, are they? Everything needs to fit in these uh, green cases. No, we take oversized items like luggage. The most common items are luggage, skis, snowboard, golf clubs, bicycles. Uh, we like to take durable kind of bigger items right now. And our, our thought is you know, if it can fit into your closet at home, it can fit into your closet in the cloud. So let's say you have a big oversized brown box. You can call up our customer service line and we'll make a, you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to make it work. Um, but the, for the focus right now is really a standardization on these bins. And for a lot of people not having to get cardboard, this is a really great uh, added feature for them. Awesome. Let's hear for Sam Rosen. Of Thank you very much. Well done.